Hey everybody, welcome back to the Living Fit After 50 show. This is Coach Dan. I am alone today. Lori is otherwise occupied. So I am taking control of the podcast. It's all me today, but really it's not me. Because I have a fantastic guest joining us, uh, Suzanne Prezio. She is a realtor, real estate agent. I'm not quite sure. Suzanne, what are you? I am a... <laughs> Real estate broker. Broker. Okay. See, I knew I was going to screw that up before we even do okay. it. So uh, Suzanne is joining us to talk about various things, but really what we're going to focus on is um, dealing with real estate after age 50 and some of the things to look for. And so let's just get started. Suzanne, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, my name is Suzanne Yakabuchi prezio I am a Capital Region native. I'm in Colony, New York, which I think is the best place in the whole wide world. Um, I've lived my entire life in what we call the 518, so upstate New York. I have, uh, in my prior life, I managed a law firm for 18 years, and then I had an opportunity to get my real estate license. Someone said the magic words, I'll pay for it. (laughs) And uh, at the time I was 42. And I thought, if I have a chance for a plan B, why not? And I sold my first house and thought, this is a pretty good gig. Uh, You know, real estate is a service industry. I wish it was all people getting married and having babies, but it's not. (laughs) And uh, there are often people that are in quite the situation. So uh, I have worked for some of the big brand companies, and a year ago, I decided I was going into my 15th year, and I decided to branch out on my own, so I opened Suzanne Prezio Properties, and I am the broker owner of that brokerage, and uh, I currently have four agents. I didn't expect to have any, and uh, this is what I do, and I couldn't imagine ever doing anything else. That's awesome. So, you know, it's funny. I've always thought about getting my real estate license, and then I saw what you have to do, and I said, no, that's not me. So, um, but I have actually, my wife, Lori, has considered it. And I always say, you know, she can sell snow to an Eskimo, so she'd probably be really good at it. Um, But I think the last time she said she was too old. Take it for what it's worth. So really what I want to kind of just dive into is, you know, we've all heard about the real estate market lately, uh, where I am in southeastern North Carolina, it's booming um, to the point that a house, they help, some of them don't even hit the market, right? They meet with an agent to list it and the agent just starts calling the list they have and the house gets sold before anybody even looks at it. They're being sold sight unseen. Um, I was talking with a real estate agent actually last week who told me that the last three or four houses he sold, the people never saw it before they bought it. They saw some pictures online and just bought it because it's that's how crazy it is here. I know it's somewhat similar up near your area. So just in general, can you talk a little bit about the market? Is it a good time to buy, sell? What are you seeing? It's a terrible time to buy. Okay. Terrible time to buy. I uh, have told... All of my buyers, if you don't have to buy right now, don't, because there's nothing to buy. We have a historic low of inventory, and uh, a healthy market is six months. We don't even have a month of inventory. To sell, if you're going to sell, go ahead. I mean, you're never going to see prices like this again. Multiple offer, people waiving inspections, sight unseen, I have a real problem with that because I have to sleep at night and I, uh, you know, somebody buying a house that they never saw or waived inspections on that, that to me is a big risk. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's kind of like people saying how, you know, you'll you'll hear in certain markets, the housing uh, boom is over and and prices are coming down. They are coming down. But they're still escalated. Just like people say, you know, gas is coming down. Yep. It's still escalated. Okay. So when something in a prime location comes on, it's gone. I mean, I just put something on on Thursday, 
with no showings until Friday. We had to call for multiple offer by five o'clock on Saturday. It was just crazy. Too many people. You know, it's interesting that you say that because there is that. I think there are quite a few people that are that are thinking the market is, I don't want to use the word downturn, but coming down. But I'm not seeing it myself. I know locally where I am, it's the exact opposite. The prices are still going up. In fact, people are getting priced out of the market, and I'll dive into more of that later. Uh, but, you know, you, where you are, you're seeing similar type stuff, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And as the interest rates uh, came down, because, you know, they, they, they hit seven. Mm -hmm. And now we're coming back down. Uh, that has increased consumer interest. The I rates mean, dropping back when, down. No, well, the rates are coming down. Yep. So the buyers are jumping back in. Okay. So once it hit seven, people got scared. Where you and I remember 18%. Oh, we do. Oh, yeah. We're old enough. We just showed our mm -hmm. age, right? <laughs> you know, people, people are always going to eat. They're always going to die. Yep. And they're always going to move. Good point. Yeah. Always. Always. Yeah. I remember my first house that I bought, I paid, it was around eight, eight and a half, somewhere in there on my interest rate. Mm -hmm. um, and then the house I'm in now where I'm filming, I originally, uh, this was in 2017, I bought this house. Originally, I was paying four and a quarter. I refinanced. Uh, it was a little over two years ago and I'm paying like two whatever now. So. And I therein was, lies the problem. Yeah. Therein I was lucky that way. Yes, but Dan, you'll never sell that house. You'll rent it. Oh, hell yeah. Because, <laughs> you, have, because you have a, a two point something percent interest rate. Yep. So you'll buy something else, rent your two point whatever house. Your tenants will pay that mortgage. This is why we have, not saying it's your fault. <laughs> no, I get I totally get it. Yeah. Homes because yeah. people aren't selling the first home it used to be you bought your starter home mm -hmm. got your equity you sold it for your bigger better home now they're not letting go of the first home yeah it's interesting you say that because especially again i'm kind of relating it to here um, but i'm sure it's happening there is they are retaining the homes and mm -hmm. turning them into either airbnbs or verbos um that's now we're a beach town where i am so it makes sense are you seeing that up there as well where are they renting short term or are they looking more for long term? Just curiosity. Well, long term, what we're having here is we're having some some government influence on housing where they're mandating that housing be like apartments be built. Uh and we're finding that a lot of complexes are gonna go up. So where single family homes would have been built, now there's going to be apartments. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's wonderful because everybody needs a place to live. But uh, if that's not your thing and what you're looking for, we're running out of space to put homes. You know, it's, it's fascinating to me to hear you say that because it's the same scenario here, right? And it seems to be, you know, having talked with various people across the country, it's not just local to where you are in New York or where I am in North Carolina, it seems to be countrywide. Um, there's a dearth of housing in the West Coast. There's people that are homeless. They Either there's not enough housing or they can't afford it, which is something I want to kind of dive into a little bit right now, if that's okay. Um, with the increase in the interest rates, you said it, it kind of slowed buying and now it's coming as they're coming back down, you're seeing increased interest. Um, where do you kind of see that going? Do you think interest rates will continue to come down or will they flat at some point? What do you think? I'm not supposed to do economic prediction, but from what I've read, uh, yeah, the rates are supposed to, uh, to come back down. Um, uh, and I had, a some of the information that I sent over to you, there's, there's stats on that. Uh, I think they think they're going to level off, uh, a little under six. Okay. Uh, if I'm if I'm recalling yeah. correctly. Yeah, it's but, yeah, we can't speak specifically about that. Right, We're because right. it's it basically the Fed sets the base rate and then the banks work off of that. So right. nothing we control. Right, uh, right. I was just curious in general because you know one of the things that we're seeing a lot of is people are relocating. Um I am formerly from the area you are. I relocated in 2019. 
Um, I have never looked back. And uh, we're seeing, you know, there's an influx where I am in North Carolina. Right now, they're saying we're the third most growing state. Um, Texas, Florida, I, I forget which one is one, one is the other, the other one's two, and we're like right there, three. Um, and most of the exodus we're seeing coming here is New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania. Um, and, you know, Texas is seeing the Californians, West Coasters. Florida, I think, is kind of a mixed bag. With relocation, you know, what are you seeing from there? You said people are holding on to their houses up there. They're rent sounds like they're renting them potentially, but still moving. Is that what's going on? Uh, well, I think what we're finding more is the people from the city are yeah. coming here, yep. buying up all of our property because you know a, a three hundred thousand dollar house here is going to cost you, you know, a million in New York City. Yep. They're buying all of our real estate and then they're they're just renting it out. Yep. Uh, the people that are leaving the state, they're leaving and they're not looking back. Because like our, what I did. our uh, <laughs> rental laws are not landlord friendly here. They are not. There were some policies put into place during COVID that, uh, you know, the court systems were backed up and it is, it is not landlord friendly at all. Um, yeah, that could be a whole separate show. <laughs> it, it could be, and I'm trying to keep a poker face here. But, you know, we, they had that joke where they were going to name uh, the former governor the Realtor of the Year for all the yeah, we sales call, that we were call generated. Him, yeah, we call Andrew Cuomo the, the U-Haul Salesman of the Year down here because <laughs> there are so many U-Hauls coming down I-95. Yeah. Uh, you drive on there it's nonstop U-Hauls coming south. And it's funny thing is like to rent a U-Haul to go from say Albany where you are uh, to where I am, it costs me like $3,000 going back. It's a few hundred. In fact, I've heard they, they are paying people to drive the trucks back. Like they'll hire you and you, you drive the truck back and then they fly you back insane i mean new york is seeing a mass exodus obviously and it's got to affect the market though right i would think um on both sides obviously it's going to drive our market up but it sounds like you're seeing an influx out of new york city to upstate new york um we're seeing a lot of people from new york city and, and it was kind of it's interesting that what you said because it is affecting home buying here because as i said they're they're buying the houses sight unseen at, you know, the average house here, avoiding the beach homes, is probably in the three to 400,000 range. Um, you know, and when you get done with interest in mortgage, your $1,500, $2,000 mortgages, depending on how long you go, when they're paying $3,000 a month for a studio apartment that's, you know, falling apart in New York City, they don't even bat an eye. Right. Um, Which is I, why they made all those rental laws, because they have such, you know, you have these people who own, you know, hundreds of apartments. Mm -hmm. They don't care if they get fined. You know, no, you no, get your mom and pop people who are renting out one side of their duplex and the same laws are applying and they don't get their rent for eight months. They're going to lose their home. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but I don't want to paint a dismal picture because where I am in upstate New York, I mean, we've got Saratoga, we've got, you know, the capital, uh, we've got, I mean, I think it's, like I said, I love it up here. Uh, our economy is, it's strong. I mean, we've, you know, you go out to, to have dinner and you've always got an hour wait. You've got, you know, everybody's driving a nice car. There's nice houses, uh, hospitals, state workers the unemployment is low. I mean, the economy here is, is strong, but it's, we are still losing a lot of residents at a, at a very fast clip. Um, but you're still going to pay top dollar for a home in upstate New York. Makes total sense, right? They're, like you said, there's people coming from different areas, buying up the homes and then they're renting people that had homes are renting them. Um, you know, when it comes to relocation, that's one of the things I wanted to kind of dive in with you a little bit about because as we get older, right, uh, and I'm a perfect example of that. You know, I lived where you live um, in Albany, 
Well, actually, I, I grew up in Albany, and then I moved to Saratoga for 30-odd years. Loved it. Rave about Saratoga to this day. Loved every minute of living there. Um, and then I met Lori and ended up moving with her, and she lived in Colony. And then we made the decision about six, seven years ago, thinking about retirement, where did we want to end up? And we knew we wanted out of New York, mostly for tax reasons, to be honest with you. Sure. Um, I won't hide that fact. Um, it's just a cheaper cost of living here. Even though we're in a resort town, it's still much cheaper to live here than it is New York. But, you know, looking at that, we started looking around and initially, you know, we had considered places like Florida. This was before, nothing to do with politics, by the way, but before the mass exodus were going on, 2015, 16. Um, and even then, the prices in Florida were inflated. Um, and then we looked at North Carolina and, you know, not to sidetrack, but basically we drove into where I am, Wilmington, North Carolina, and in three minutes we knew we wanted to live here. I mean, it literally was like that. Um, and then found our house and lo and behold, we're here. I don't know that we're the norm. What are you seeing as far as relocation? Are you starting to see the older boomers? We are boomers, right? <laughs> Uh, are you starting to see more of them moving or are you seeing younger families moving? What are you seeing with that? Our area, we get a lot of people who relocate in because we have GE, we have global foundries. Uh, we have a lot of doctors because of the hospitals. Uh, so it's a mix. It's a mix of young people, young professionals uh, because especially with Global Foundries, we'll have people coming in from Germany and Australia. Uh, but you also have your people who want to who want to become snowbirds. They don't necessarily give up the house that they have here. Mm -hmm. So um, they they you know I guess it's a it's 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 a mix. You do have some people who say, okay, I'm out. I just relocated my brother to South Carolina. So <laughs> he was the first duck to leave the pond too. It was we were like, well, that's, that's the other thing that happens, right? There's usually that person that leaves. And then next thing you know, everybody's starting to follow him down. Uh, we're, oh, yeah. seeing, we're seeing that everybody's reaching out to us going, Hey, how do you like it there? Blah, blah, blah. And we're like, Nope, we're full. Sorry. Don't come. Yeah. Um, they come anyway, but, um, uh, it's just funny how that works in, but with relocation, and this is kind of where I want to start going over is, is, you know, you've got a lot of considerations to make, especially as you're older. Um, what, what do you think is like the biggest thing that people don't think about in terms of relocation, specifically real estate side of it, um, that maybe they should think about? Is there anything in particular that you would stand out to you? Sure. Sure. The, the, the first thing after, of course, they call me, <laughs> <laughs> they should call their financial advisor. Okay. This is, this is a, a financial decision to relocate. What's, what's the tax ramification? What's the cost of living going to be? Mm -hmm. And you have to, you know, there's, there's something people our age who are moving it is either because they're downsizing, they're looking for something that will be sufficient for a multi-generational thing, or they may also be dealing with an inheritance where they have to sell their parents' home. On top of downsizing mm -hmm. to do something, they may have another property that they've got to juggle as well. So when you start mixing all those finances together, your financial advisor is the first person you want to call. I, I actually completely agree with you. That would have been my answer. Um, and I don't have the expertise you do, but having been through it, that very first thing you need to do is look at that. There are tax ramifications to selling your house um, at 55 and up potentially. Um, inheritance is another one. Good, good point on that. You do need to really to kind of go off the phrase you used earlier, you need to get your ducks in a row before they leave the pond because there could be some significant tax issues, but also benefits, right? It can go both ways. There's a little bit of both. So I agree with you 100%. Talk to your financial advisor. What would you say after that would be the next step? 
when they're getting ready to sell. Well, they're considering it. Like you know, you you've well, thought about you thought about leaving. You talked to your financial advisor. You kind of okay, maybe I'll start looking. Um, where would you go from there? What would you recommend as a realtor or? Well, worker? you know, you, you want to live where you want to play. Okay. Uh, but also, you have to take into consideration. You know, my neighbor who's a respiratory therapist, told me one day and totally totally ruined the day, shattered the rest of the day. We're only meant to live until 40. So, really? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm working in my yard. Well, you know, Suzanne, we're only supposed to live till we're 40. I'm like, this is like Logan's run. Where's you, the doc? You so, just crushed me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll want to be, you know, you know, do you want to, if you do run into medical problems, do you want a 90 minute drive to a hospital, to medical services. So when you relocate, you probably want to be near these conveniences. Like, you know, if, you, if all of your out-of-town guests are coming, do you want to have to drive three hours to the airport? Um, so your location. I mean, that's what real estate's all about, right? Location, location, location. Yep. So when you're thinking about moving, you don't want to be spending all your time stuck in traffic or oh, your dad's got to go to the doctor and it's going to be 45 minutes one way. That's important. Also, the home that you choose, the bedrooms really shouldn't be on the second floor. Good you point. You should have a full bath on the first floor. Yep. I was in a car accident where I ended up having to have ankle surgery. And I am not a little girl that can do that cute little hop on crutches. I had to <laughs> crawl up the stairs and, you know, and just the three, I live in a ranch and just the three steps to get into the house, that was tough. It was really tough. So one floor living, wider doorways, because, you know, if you end up needing a walker uh, and you can be the healthiest person, it's mm -hmm. just, you could be minding your own business and an accident happens. Next thing you know, you're, you need a knee scooter, you're on crutches, or you need a walker. You want to be able to fit in rooms, turn around in them. So, so if, you know, things that are going to be accessible for people that have special needs. You know, that's a great point all of those that you brought up and it's funny because when we were looking when laura and i were looking everything you just said was what was the priority on our list and i i actually feel like we were the exception not the norm people tend, i i feel maybe i'm wrong but people i think tend to look at you know what what are the what's the house going to give me you know i i'm looking for the best possible house Whereas our criteria, we knew we wanted to downsize. We had ballpark 2,500 square feet in New York. We did not want that. We were living basically in three rooms, the bedroom, the living room, and the kitchen, right? Uh, we didn't need the whole downstairs. We never set foot in <laughs> for weeks at a time. Right. right? Uh, we had a raised ranch ourselves. Uh, and so, you know, the criteria we gave uh, in working with our realtor here was one we wanted single floor only no stairs whatsoever um that was a, and for the exact reasons you're talking about we're fine now we could climb stairs but we're this is our forever home i'm dying in this home so i did not want to be 75 years old and have to worry about climbing stairs to go to bed every night that was a big one for us probably the biggest one um downsizing was another thing we were adamant about that because to the realtor's credit, they were trying to figure out what we wanted and let's go look at this and showed us a couple of bigger ones. Uh, just more so, as as he was saying, just to get a feel for it, right? So that, to see if that's what, do you really want to downsize? And, you know, I, I have to say, I appreciated the hell out of that because it's a, it's a difficult thing to downsize. Um, we're still doing it. <laughs> you know, we had a storage right. space. Um, we just actually emptied that out and we've been here almost four years. So those, you know, the considerations are for us are the exact things you're talking about the future. And I think a lot of people, and I'm, I'm looking to see if you, what your input is on that. I don't think a lot of people actually think about that. They want to know what am I going to get now? You know, I want a five bedroom house with five bathrooms that's going to cost you 
you know, I don't know, half a million dollars. I'm just picking a number. You know, that's the other side of it is what are you going to be able to afford? Not now because you might be working decent income, but what are you going to have when you're 65, 70, 75, and you're on, say, Social Security or a fixed income? Do you see a lot of the considerations the way that we approached it, or are you seeing the opposite, which is my thought? Well, what I'm seeing is people who get stars in their eyes because, oh my gosh, we got this house and it was only this much. You know, we got this big, beautiful house and, you know, it was $270,000. And, and yes, it's gorgeous and it's, you know, but what they're not looking at is, and I've seen this happen where, and I'm myself the most morbid person, they, they buy their dream home. And they start their, you know, the back nine of their life. Yep. And one of the spouses pass away. Oh, there's a good point. Well, now you moved to this economically sound place because you bought this really cheap house where everything is, well, I shouldn't say cheap, I, I don't, you know, inexpensive and house. That was a good way to put where, it, yeah. <laughs> um, where now you're alone and you don't know anybody. You strictly bought based upon location, mm -hmm. and I've seen this happen where now the spouse sells the house and comes back because Interesting. they didn't plan, they didn't build a new a new existence where they are. They simply just bought because they bought based upon affordability. Interesting. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny you mentioned something that kind of triggered something in my mind that we also thought about is you got to clean the house. <laughs> yeah. When you're older, you know, people will say to me, you live in a 900 square foot house? Yeah, I do. And I love every minute of it because I can clean this whole thing in half an hour if I have to. Um, you know, and some people say, oh, you can hire a cleaner. Sure, you can, right, if, if you have the money. Uh, but it's I, I look at all those things because I see people in our age group, you know, the the 50s to early 60s somewhere in there not to date us but um they don't really i don't see them really thinking about this i have friends here literally my entire house would fit in their kitchen and living room that's how big they're in the house and i'm like you got to clean this <laughs> and they're you know one of them in particular a good friend of mine he's 75 years old his wife is 76 i think she's a little bit older my entire house would fit in their kitchen kitchen dining room living room um and they talk about it they don't even go into certain areas because they don't have to clean up afterward so as a realtor or real estate agent what do you i mean do you are you able to coach people on that um what do you see with that like how how resistant are they to you know like i have people say to me they think we're poor because we live in a 900 square foot house no we're not poor uh i just prefer to spend my money elsewhere so I, what do you see with all that and how, are, how have reactions been with it oh people are usually so appreciative i mean i have I have over 145 star reviews mm -hmm. because people appreciate the fact that you know if we go look at a house I'll say to them, I'm going to do one of two things. I always go in the basement first because we have, I don't care if Rob Lowe is living in that house. If we have a bad basement, we're not buying it. But <laughs> okay. I will say to them, I'll be in the car. And that means mm -mm, because if I don't like the house, they're not buying it. So pointing out those things, people don't think about that because it's kind of like the way that marketing is when you go to the store, everything is on the eye level shelves that they want you to buy. Yep. They don't think you're going to look at the bottom or the very top. And it's the same thing with housing. You're going to have to pay to heat this place, pay to put a new roof on, Yeah, you know, the point. chemicals, you know, unless you're in uh, an all-inclusive, you know, HOA community, which those homes usually sell for more because that's, that seems to be where people are gravitating, that they want, they want even the younger people. The younger people, they don't want to be stuck with yard work. They don't want to have to do maintenance. They want their weekends to be able to to golf, to travel. Mm -hmm. So the the HOA communities are really the ones that are knocking it out of the park. 
Yeah, there the HOA is all the thing here where we are now. When I lived in New York, I, I mean, you hear about them, but I, you never. I, my experience was they were few and far between. All right. Mm -hmm. Here, it's the exact opposite. Finding a right. place that's not HOA can be darn near impossible. And that was one of the criteria I had was to not be HOA. Um, if I want to put a palm tree in my yard, damn it, I'm going to put a palm tree in my yard. You know, if I right. want to paint my house hot pink with black shutters, which I keep threatening to do, um, my wife will not let me, um, then I'm going to do it with there's pluses and minuses to HOAs, um, and that's something that I, that's a great point you brought up uh, because that is a big consideration in the South. They are it's predominantly HOA from what I've seen, um, and I've heard the horror stories. You know, you, they will you get the what's the term somebody use HOA Karen, whatever that is. That you know they're the president and the power goes to their head. And they'll they'll knock on your door and fine you because your grass is a quarter inch too tall, you know, um, or you know any anything they can find, they will try and get you. And when you're trying to relocate, you don't. I would never have thought about those things if I had not been educated, right? Um, my wife's cousin happens to be a real estate agent, property manager, and he's like. Here's the reality about HOAs. There's some really good stuff. Your lawn's taken care of in some of them. You're going to get a pool potentially, right? Workout areas. All, that's all positive. A lot of positive. And then he was telling us the other side of it. Um, and, and then the other thing is the fees. I mean, there are places here, no joke, you're paying $2,000 a month in HOA fees. Wow. Um, wow. Now, I'm not saying that's like our neighborhood, right? You would never pay that there. But... You go down near the beach towns, no joke, fifteen hundred, two thousand a month. The place is immaculate. Don't get me wrong, but they're trying to cover. You know, they have security guards out front, right? They're closed, gated com communities. That ain't free. So when you're trying to relocate, you know, all right, I'm going to buy X dollar house. My mortgage will be roughly this. My taxes will be roughly this, and then you get slammed with fifteen hundred dollars on top of it. Usually, you're getting priced out. Um, it sounds like it's starting to come more into New York area where there are, are there more HOAs. Are you starting to see that? Yeah, I mean, yes, but not, not, I mean, it's still pretty much just your single family homes. You know, I mean, we do have communities of single family homes that have HOAs, mm -hmm. but that's, you know, that's more Saratoga County. Uh, so it's, you know, we, I, I would say we're not getting an influx of it. We're getting more condos uh, and, and, and townhomes built that have them. Yeah, they'll have so, the fees also, right? If you're buying a yes. condo, potentially the bill, I forget what the term is, but building fees, I call them. You know, um, and that's stuff that you need to consider. And that's where you sure. come in, right? You can kind of guide people with that. Um, tell you what, why don't we take a quick break now and then I want to come back and kind of talk about that whole process, right? What it would be like to, what you should do with when you're working with your real estate agent as far as like selling your house, buying a house, that kind of stuff. So let's take a few minutes, all right? Uh, I am going to step aside, get a drink, enjoy myself for a couple of minutes and then we're going to come back to Suzanne and continue the discussion right here on the Living Fit After 50 podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Living Fit After 50 show. I am joined by our amazing guest, Suzanne Prezio, and we are talking real estate considerations, uh, what you should be thinking about if you're considering potentially relocating or buying or selling your home um, and the things to look out for. So where I wanna kinda go now is talk about the process a little bit. So um, Suzanne, whether you're from both perspectives, a buyer or a seller, um, what the first question I guess that comes to my mind is how do you find a good realtor or a real estate agent? Uh, two ways. As much as I Zillow. <laughs> really? Zillow reviews. Wait a minute. Zillow, reviews. Zillow really? Absolutely. Their reviews. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. I always heard bad things about Zillow. Uh, Zillow, as far as their Zestimate, 
Uh, but as far as reviews, because you can't fake those. Okay. You have to buy, be either the one of the parties to the transaction. It's not like when you go on, you know, on Google and you read a restaurant review. That can be all of the owner's friends writing things or, yep. or disgruntled employee. But yep. as far as Zillow, those reviews are accurate. Also, you know, if somebody has a Google business page, um, and then word of mouth, talk to people that you know that have purchased homes. Mm -hmm. Who did you use? Who, you know, that's what you wanted. People who have had the experience. Because uh, a real estate agent, what they're going to teach them at the big box broker is, oh, hey, Mike, welcome. There's your desk. Fake it till you make it. And really? then Mike okay. is going to come out. Oh, yeah. My, it's not like it used to be. And then Mike's going to come out to your listing appointment and is going to say, well, my company has sold over X amount of homes over the last X years. Well, the consumer doesn't know to say, well, Mike, how many homes have you sold? Well, none. <laughs> this is my first, you know. And, you know, everybody has to start somewhere. I, I get that. I get that. But he, he, I would say read those reviews and talk to people. Don't go by the billboards and the the commercials and the you know the postcards. Talk to people. And sometimes sometimes the rookie can be your best agent because you're their only client. That's a good point. They're gonna give you a hundred percent of their energy. So I I don't have anything. Part of the reason I broke out in my own brokerage was I wanted to work with rookies because I knew they'd be trained right. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like seeing somebody get their first sale and they're going to give you 100% because they just feel so, so honored and lucky to have your business. Yeah, so. one advantage I think too, I have in your particular situation, I think you said you had three or four agents that work under you. They also get you though, right? So they're getting oh, yeah. your years of expertise, even though they may be a newer agent, you're kind of their mentor, right? For lack of a better term, they're apprenticing almost underneath you. So, I mean, would you recommend, not? To, I'm trying to keep this polite, but would you recommend avoiding the bigger agency, so to speak? Or and looking at someone maybe like yourself, I know you got to be careful with that. But um, what are your thoughts on that? What I would say is this: No matter if you sell your home with a big box company, mm -hmm. with a boutique company, or even for sale by owner, your property is going to go on Zillow. Okay. So when you have companies come in and say, "Well," We have all this marketing and it's 24 seven and we have signs that someone can, you know, scroll a QR code and we're going to get a text and know your house is going to be seen on Zillow, even if you do for sale by owner. Now for sale, for sale by owners historically get 17% less than if they hired a realtor. That was going to be a question I had later. <laughs> I cheated. I looked. Anyone in this market uh -huh. can get a home under contract. Anyone. There's not enough inventory. It's keeping it there. And that is where I pride myself and what my company does in that my people are all trained. And, and I'm a control freak. I go with them on their appointments. I go with them on their showings. I'm, I want them to know what they're doing. Anybody can get you under contract. It's keeping it there and getting you over the finish line. So like anything, you got to go with who you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I would say is go on the internet, print out those 20 questions to ask a realtor when you're interviewing and ask those questions and see who gives you the answers that you, you, you know, don't make the hair stand up in the back of your neck. <laughs> Who you click with, you know? Right. Some people want want that brand, like Coke, Pepsi. They mm -hmm. want that brand of the big box. Other people like the more personal experience. 
Yeah, it, it, and there's no right or wrong. It's what works right. best for you well. as the person because, I mean, this is a huge transaction in your life, financially, emotionally, all of that. So to mm-hmm. have that partner, if you will, that can support you through that, because that's what you guys also do. I think a lot of people don't realize that. They look at you as they're just buying and selling house with me, right? No, they're your partner, I feel. Um, you become our partner. You know what we're, you kind of learn who we are. Like I said, with our process, they, they wanted us to see houses they knew we weren't interested in, just to see how we would react so they could learn from it. And I, I like I said earlier, I was fascinated by that and I appreciated it because, yeah, you're going from 2,500 to 900 square feet. Do you really realize what that means, right? And that's what yeah. she was, both, the, we actually had two different people helping us. Um, I, I just feel that having that connection, you know, from the other side, I think that's frankly the most important part, right? If if you have a good solid connection and you get a good agent that maybe doesn't know everything, but can go to someone like yourself and learn, win win, right? Um, it, well, what you're touching on, this is a service industry. Mm-hmm. And somewhere along, like everyone knows, HDTV is not allowed on in my home. It, it will cost <laughs> me. Yeah. Just get that. I'm going to show you three houses and you're going to buy one. Yeah. Okay. Why don't you show the real estate agent that's in the middle of cooking dinner, trying to help their child with science homework. Uh, they've got to run out of the house because they have to bring their mom to an appointment. And now somebody just called and said, guess what? There's a buried oil tank on the property. And they burst into tears because they have to move. Uh huh. This is a service industry. I wish it was people getting married and having babies. <laughs> it's not. Somebody lost their job. They died. They're getting divorced. You know, they, they had an accident. They can't afford right. the mortgage. We see a lot of tears in this business. We see a lot of them. And you... If you are in this for the right reason, and that being helping people, mm-hmm. you will do well. If you are in this because, I, I mean, I don't know when real estate agents became movie stars. It just. When Love It or List It came out. And I will <laughs> yeah. tell you right now, I love that show. I Ugh. absolutely, I watch every episode of it and it is so unrealistic. Um, yeah. And it's funny, they used to film in Canada. Now they film in Raleigh, not far from me. Ah. So you start hearing things, right? Um, so basically, you know, they make it look so easy on the show. It is oh, yes. anything but. And the other thing I always crack up about is if you notice every single person on there can afford a million dollar mortgage. And I'm like, why don't you do a show with someone who's on a fixed income that can maybe afford 2000 a month, not 20000 a month, you know? Exactly. Um, but it does, I think, this is a good point to kind of touch on. It, do you see that that affects people's expectations when working with you? Because they do watch shows like that, right? And they, you know, they're walking in and they, you know, you're, you're looking at a million, million and a half dollar home and, and this person can't afford it but they think they can. Do you see some of that? I call it the HGTV effect from my end. Uh, Maybe you call it something different, but what do you see with that? Well, that I would say is 100% agent ability in that if an agent is going to be foolish enough to show houses to someone and not know what that person can afford, then that's on that agent. Any buyer that I work with, I'm going to have a buyer counseling session with them. We're going to first get them pre-qualified so we know what they can afford. And I want to be clear on something because, you know, we're in in New York, we've come out with a lot of fair housing regulations about, you know, anti-discrimination, which I, I agree with. But... To me, I find the most discriminatory thing when someone calls and says, well, I can, my my budget is up to $100,000 and no real estate agent will help them because it's really hard to find a house for $100,000. Especially these days, yeah. That's in good condition too, right? Well, you know, and they're usually not and it's a lot of work and it's a lot of... But that's 
all people should have housing. Mm-hmm. And I'm a conservative person, so it's not like I, you know, but I don't think, I think to me that should be the biggest violation if I said, well, I'm not, I'm not going to work with you. I'm not going to make enough money. That's not okay. No, if someone not, yeah. calls for housing help, then we should help them. But they do have to talk to somebody about financing first. So to answer your question, if somebody comes in and they say, well, Suzanne, I want you know four bedrooms and an in-ground pool, and I want to be in this school district that has the highest taxes in the entire, and, and my budget is, then I have to say to them, this is what that, uh, uh, that budget will will get you mm-hmm. so we can do a couple of things we can look in in that price point or you can wait and build up your your income and increase your pre-approval amount mm-hmm. and then we can look for those things or you know we might we might be able to find those mm-hmm. things but maybe in, in an area that's more in the outskirts Mm-hmm. So um, I don't have that problem with people in that I ask the questions before we get in the car. Yeah, that's so that's kind of where I want to go with all that is so you you know you go you find your agent and you kind of touched on what one of the things I want to kind of go a little bit further on you talked about the twenty questions what would you say are the top let's say three questions I as someone who has looking to sell my house let's say that i'm going to ask the agent what should what would be the top three questions i should ask the agent to determine if they're qualified are you a full-time agent interesting one because there's a lot of part-timers isn't there oh yeah imagine you need me something's going on mm. and I, dan I, got, I gotta call you later you know i'm, <laughs> I'm at work yeah, yeah. Or, or you just can't get me at all. Or, geez, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be available, you know, until, you know. Uh, so are you a full-time agent? Okay. Uh, what is your average sale price? Okay. That's not one I would have thought of. Why would you ask that? that just out of curiosity. Well, say you're selling a $500,000 home mm-hmm. and... My average price is two thirty. So they're handling. I don't want to use the term I, lesser homes, but lower, least less expensive homes. How's that? Is that a good? I don't have for? a lot of experience what in the, your price point. Right. I'm not going to know what a coffered ceiling is. I'm not going to know. And I don't know what one is. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you have your homework tonight. That's why I would hire you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what area do you cover? That now there's an interesting one. So, correct me if I'm wrong. Agents are are they licensed by the state or pretty much yes. everywhere? Right. I know New York is in right. North Carolina, but that would be anywhere. Correct. Any state. I would um, think so. I would. Yeah, think it would make so. sense, right? But well, I'm licensed in New York State. But you can do in theory. You could sell anywhere in New York State. Right. You but then you would don't. Sue. You want to niche down to where you are, right? And. There's something called competence. Okay. In that, I don't know the first thing about New York City. So I'll give you a great example. I had former clients of mine and they called me last year and said, there's a house that we want to buy. But they said a camp, uh, which it ended up being like $600,000. Um, but they said there's camp that we want to buy in Crown Point, which is Lake Champlain. And uh, that's about three hours for me. And I said, all right, well, you know, I'll get you in touch with an agent out there. Uh, the nice thing about that is I'll still be part of the transaction and that I'll be in touch with the agent. But, uh, you know, I'll have them help you out there. No, Suzanne, we want you. We, we know how you work. We, we want to work with you. And I said, I don't know the first thing about Crown Point much to my you know i was quite flattered they said we don't care we want you okay. so i don't know anything about crown point i couldn't tell you comps i couldn't tell you where anything is i'd have you have to disclose that because 
how am I really going to market your house and help you sell your house when I don't know the first thing about it? So, you know, you have a, a geographic region that you're comfortable in. Now, this worked out well in that, yes, we did get this transaction done. I did help them solely. It was kind of good that they brought an outsider in mm -hmm. because I was able to go in and not worry that I was going to offend somebody in this small town, which I did. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you, uh, you know, you want to find out where their, where their, their backyard is where they're going to know they're going to be able to say, you know, there's two ways into this neighborhood. Oh, you're going to want to eat at this place. And, you know, this is a, a great shortcut to get from A to B um, because somebody that doesn't know the area isn't going to be able to tell you, oh, there's a new complex being built mm -hmm. that's going to block your view of whatever. So those those things are important. You know, it's, you, you're striking a chord with me on some of this stuff because one of the things that I think I wish we had done more is we had an agent selling our house in New York. We had an agent here. They never really talked to each other, right? Oh, yeah, no, they should have. Um, that, and it, it all worked out fine, don't get me wrong. But I had almost, as I reflect back on it, I kind of wish they, we had, and it's our fault, we never put them in contact with each other. I, I take... 100% of the responsibility, but it would have been interesting to kind of get feedback from both of them on the whole process, right? Because we were going through selling our house up there, which took a lot longer than we thought it was going to. Um, down here, we found our house within a matter of days. I mean, it was one of those things, and I'm sure you've run into this. Um, we were going around on a Saturday morning. We looked at four places. This was number five. And I bought it because it had a palm tree. I will not lie. Um, you know, we looked in the house. My wife and I looked at each other and went, yes. And then I stepped in the backyard and there's a palm tree of all things, right? And we just knew. But I, so we had a house here. We ended up renting it for a while because we were trying to sell up there. And, but I think if we had had the benefit of having the, the agents talk with each other, I think it would have helped us. And that was one of the points I hadn't really thought about until you mentioned it now is having that ability to kind of, even though it's two different states, um, having them work together, I think would have really benefited us. Well, yeah. So to, to, so to any of your listeners, if they're selling their house and thinking of buying one, the agents do need to talk because I'm going to want to know when are you closing on your house? And when we do you ran have into that, be, yeah. You know? <laughs> And how is that sale going? Because is this purchase contingent on the sale and close of your current home? Mm -hmm. Not just the sale. Because, you know, an agent can write, you know, here we use attorneys. An agent can write contingent upon the sale of, you know, Dan's home. Mm -hmm. Well, the sale means a contract. The close means a check and keys exchanged. Right. Hand, yep. You know, you know, and other questions that you want to ask, what are your hours? Are you an agent who has a voicemail that says, you know, I, I'm with my family after six o'clock. I'll talk to you tomorrow. The world blows up after six o'clock. That's when everything happens in real estate. I would think How, that's when most people would want to be available, want you to be available. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I'll have people call and say, I'm so sorry to bother you on the weekend. Listen, the only days I don't want to be bothered, Mother's Day and my kids' birthdays. Other than that, I'll see you on Christmas. We're good. <laughs> um, how do you want to communicate? Are you a phone person? Are you a text person? Are you an email person? You know, may I call you during the work day? Is it okay? Those are important questions. I, you know, I'm from that generation where if somebody's texting me all the time, I start to think it's avoidance behavior. Every once in a while, I want to talk on the phone. I want to do a quick Very, Zoom call. very common for our age group. Yeah. 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 Text makes me We're paranoid. Ourselves. I feel like I'm, <laughs> like I'm being broken up with, you know? Yeah. Uh, so those are, those are, you know, are you open to, you know, I'll ask my buyers, what are deal breakers? Suzanne, uh, don't show me anything with a pool. Okay. Don't, you know, I need a garage. Uh, I I have to have a fireplace. Is this a want or is it a need? Mm -hmm. Is it a must? You know, what are things that will make you, like me, I could never live in a raised ranch. I have, you know, four 
four sizes of clothing that I need to house. <laughs> <laughs> so I need a place to keep my clothes. I could never live in a raised ranch. So instead of wasting not only the buyer's time, but the seller's time, because you got to remember the seller cleaned the house, yep. took the dog out, had to bring the kids to the park, whatever, you know, it, it, it's, if you know to have somebody come in for a three minute showing i, I blame the agent because the, again they didn't ask questions mm -hmm. to say because I'll, I'll say to some of my buyers you're not going to like this house i want you to drive by it first because i don't want to do that to the seller this would be like one they found right yeah one that they found and i'll tell you this too buyers will say to me you know have somebody call me and i always ask them who's your agent well, we didn't sign anything yet. And I'll say, did that agent show you houses? Because I don't want to steal anybody's client. That's not how I want to get my business. Mm -hmm. Well, we found the house. Now, let's think about this. Your agent is probably out with other clients. Maybe in a closing, maybe at a showing, maybe in an appointment. You're at your job <laughs> and you're on realtor.com looking at houses you cannot fault your agent because they didn't send you that house okay you're looking for you they're looking for probably 15 other people so the fact that you found the house who cares mm -hmm. do you not pay your doctor if you find a lump or something oh i found a lump sorry doc <laughs> it's it's i mean to me that's that's just you know, the HGTV shows, they, <laughs> They've had they an effect. <laughs> get, you know, because it makes it look like all we do is unlock the door. Here's the living room. Here's the dining room. Let's go buy a contract. Yeah. They don't show that sometimes we'll show a hundred houses and the buyer then decides that they're going to go rent their aunt's place. But, you know, you've been great. Oh, good. I'll tell National Grid that when they want their bill. Yeah, you still got to pay your bills, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because we don't get paid unless we close. Meaning your gas, your time, the mailings, the research, the phone calls. But there's You do not get paid. You do not get an hourly salary. You have no health insurance. You have no uh, vacation time, no sick time. It is 100% commission. And if your buyer never buys something, that was all on you. Yeah, it, it, that brings up a point that I kind of wanted to touch on is, you know, a lot of people are confused by really how you do get paid, right? It's They, they kind of know it's commission. Um, I, I was aware you don't get anything hourly, even starting out, right? It's just you're, you, you either sell or you don't. It's, it's that right. simple. You um, eat but, what you kill. There you go. Great way to put it. What what are typically what as, you know? If I was selling my house or buying a house, what would the agent get from that typically for all that time? You're putting in a tremendous amount of time and work. I feel. Um, what would what would be f the norm? I guess I I know it kind of fluctuates a little bit depending on the area. I would assume, but maybe I'm wrong on, on all that. What would a normal expectation would be? What would it be? Uh, well, the because I have to be careful of federal trade violations with price fixing. I charge, I charge as the seller, as the listing agent, mm -hmm. six percent. Okay. Out of the six percent, I offer a co broke, which is customarily two and a half percent. So whomever brings in the buyer. My brokerage will pay that brokerage two and a half percent of the six percent. Ah, okay. So it's not in addition to, it comes out of your money. Right. Okay. Right. So now when an agent is working for a broker, the broker may have desk fees that they charge every month. They may on top of that have a franchise fee. <laughs> then they'll take a percentage then they may charge an errors and omission fee to cover for any liability. I used to have a piece of paper that I would just rip. <laughs> I'd say, here's the check. 
and then I'm going to have to pay this and this and this. And I'd hold up this little speck of paper and I would tell my potential seller, if I was making what you thought I was making, I drive a much nicer car and I dress a lot better. And that was the point I wanted to make is because I hear all the time, oh, they're making a ton of money. Yeah. One, you got to have an office. You got those expenses, like you kind of touched on. All the other stuff, you're you're splitting the fee with someone. Yeah, you know, it's not easy. And that, what I would say to people is, listen to what she just said. They're 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 working very hard. Um, you know, and and kind of touched on this before. A lot of people say, I don't want to pay an agent. I want to keep that money for myself. I'm going to sell the home myself. Mm-hmm. Now, I personally would never do that. Hey, one, it's too much work. I no, I I want to pay a professional, which is what you are, to do it for me. But there are those people that think it's easy. Uh, you know, especially in this market where you know, you put a for sale sign up, you're going to have 10 people knocking on your door, but you yes. don't realize all the other work that's involved in that. Can you touch a little bit about the advantages of, I, I know them, but the advantages of hiring you versus trying to sell it yourself. I was a for sale by owner. You were. Before I got my real estate license, I was a for sale by owner because I wasn't going to pay somebody all that money to say, here's a living room, here's a dining room. <laughs> <laughs> so when my house sat and sat and sat, I then hired an agent and I was disappointed because I got what I paid for because I went to a discount brokerage. Okay. So what your what your realtor should do is, you know, price your house honestly, not to the market, but to you. Okay. The seller. What I mean by that is you know, I could go into Macy's and tell them I want a size four. It is not going to fit. Okay. When I have a seller tell me, well, we have, you know, uh, you know, oak floors and we have level four granite. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Price the house fairly. Price it competitively. I'm not saying give it away, but. Mm-hmm. A realtor should price your house and give you the unvarnished truth. You know, I'm sorry, your cat, I'm detecting, or your cat, your house, I'm detecting you have cats. That's I'm picking that yeah. up. Yep. You know, yep. um, you know, these things should be painted. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to put my hand in your pocket, but it's better to spend a thousand dollars and replace maybe a vanity, some old carpet do some painting, then have to take a $10,000 price reduction. Mm -hmm. So your realtor should go through and tell you all the things that should be done to bring the house up to market standard. Again, I'm not saying I go in and tell people you have to put in a whole new kitchen, but there's things that can make the house look better. Uh, I would say the the most important thing an agent can do is pick up the phone, Mm -hmm. answer that call, because what happens is we're a microwave society. People want things right away. If someone calls me on, uh, say, Dan, say I'm selling your home and they call me and I don't answer, they're just going to call any real estate agent. Okay. They want to see your house. Mm -hmm. Well, that real estate agent that they just called, they're driving their car right now. Yeah, I am calling about the house on 123 Main Street. Oh, yeah, sure. When do you want to see it? Uh, Tomorrow at 6. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that works. And they hang up. They haven't asked if they're pre-qualified. They haven't asked any questions. They don't even know if they're able to buy. They might just be dreaming right now. Mm -hmm. Where if I had answered my phone as the agent, I could say, well, let me tell you a little bit about the house first. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it's interesting. I think, you know. Like I said, I would never consider doing it as a for sale by owner because I don't know enough to to really know. <laughs> and you, know, you bring up some good points is we tend to get emotional about our houses, right? We <laughs> think that, uh, I don't know, a particular countertop is the most amazing thing ever, but the market doesn't. Um, and it's funny because when we sold our house up there, our kitchen was from the 1970s with the god-awful orange counters. 
<laughs> and, you know, had, you know, in retrospect, had I slapped some paint on the counters maybe, because we ended up, when we moved here, we painted our counters and we went, oh, why didn't we do that up there? Because it probably would have made the house look better. Um, and the cabinets were from the 70s. You, you would have laughed if you walked in there. But we were at the point where we had our house here. We wanted out. So we took pr less price because we didn't want to invest in it um, because we put ourselves under pressure, right? And that, that's something I would want to bring out to people is, look, you find that dream home, which we did. And yeah, you might have to pounce, which we had to because we would have been in trouble. But you don't realize that on the back side of that, we probably, I, I'm guessing, we probably lost ten to $20,000 because if we had slapped the paint a coat here, or paint a coat, a coat of paint hey, here, or, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of my, they were all minor things, but I think they added up. And that's, again, as someone who, if you try and sell it yourself, you may not look at that and see that because you see what the market is looking for every day. You know, some people want marble. Other people want granite. To me, I couldn't tell you what what's the difference between them. But I know in my mind, and I think that's the HDTV effect, right? Everything's got to be perfect. But it's, it's interesting what you're bringing out is that that's why I would personally encourage someone to hire an expert, a professional. Because, yeah, you might save a few thousand dollars, but how much did you lose? Um, and I think right. that's kind of what you're saying, right? Oh, yeah. And what sellers don't realize is if they price a house too high, they become invisible. Okay. You've seen it. You've seen that house on the market where you've said, what? They want what for that? Mm -hmm. And then a month goes by. Wow, that house is still on the market. Oh, wow. I wonder how why that hasn't sold. Wow, that's still out there. Wow. this There must be something where if you just price it where it should be priced, I've never had somebody say to me, I don't think you charged enough for my house. Because okay. even if you price it, I call it the sweet spot where I price my things or where they should have sold in a normal market. Mm -hmm. And typically the market drives the price up. They will, Especially they will now, pay more. right? You start getting bidding and all that stuff. Yeah. 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 But if you if you overprice your home, then you're going to be invisible. You're just going to sit and you're going to sit. And would it be yeah. fair to oh say gosh, when some? So oh, sorry. we got a visitor. She's, no, that's visitors she, are this welcome. Is, this is Lucy. Hi, <laughs> She's Lucy. the most. I've already like shooed her away about eight times, so she, she needed is, to make her debut. She okay. is more than welcome to join us. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that I find interesting that I do even now and you mentioned Zillow earlier, is I still have the Zillow app on my phone. So I get a periodic thing going, your house is worth blah, 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 right? Um, and I, I have no intentions of selling. I'm not ever selling. But I just kind of look at it and go, my house doubled in price. Um, now, the funny thing is, is I think other people who are selling are doing that same thing, not realizing that uh, I'll use my house as an example. Like I said, it's 900 square feet. I bought it 141,000. The exact same houses are going in my neighborhood for close to 300 now. Wow. And they're not lasting hours, let alone days. All right. But the other side of that is, I mean, our house was in good shape when we bought it. Um, we've seen some of it because, you know, they do an open house every once in a while. And you always wonder now, why are they doing an open house? There's something wrong because... It never gets to that point anymore. And then we'll go look at them because, you know, we're nosy neighbors. And you see, like, the house is like, it needs to be demolished in some cases. I, I Do you see that happening a lot where people go on Zillow and they come to you and they go, Suzanne, you know, Zillow's telling me my house is worth 300000 But you look at it and go, your walls are falling apart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this thing's barely standing. How do you handle that? I'm just curious as an agent. How do you, because that's got to be a difficult conversation. It, it, you know, there's something to be said for being blunt. And uh, <laughs> I don't have, I don't have a problem with that at You're all. You're my kind of people then, because I'm <laughs> blunt too. <laughs> you know, uh, in, in that, 
you know, I'll just pull up the comps and show them this is what your house is going to sell for. This is what all the similar houses have sold for. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you, you can't lie with, or I'm sorry, you can't lie. You can't argue with, with stats that are right there in real time. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I don't, I don't have a problem with people like that. And if I do get somebody that's, that's stubborn and they want to dig their heels in, then they're not the client for me. You know, um, you know, I've seen it. I've been very fortunate in that in my career, I've had less than less than a handful of people um, go with an, another agent. And believe me, I watch those homes <laughs> and <laughs> when they haven't listened to me and I see they end up selling for less than what I told them because they made themselves invisible. They kind of do. They kind of reach desperation in some cases, and they'll just start yeah, cutting because, price. Yeah, because now they they're they they've sat for so long that they become what we call stigmatized. I was going to ask yeah. about that. Is, is there a is there a time frame that a house in quotes should sell in before it becomes that? Um, what what would that be? Just out of curiosity. In this market, if something hasn't sold in 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 a month. And I mean, I say in a month, really in two weeks, if something hasn't sold in a month, what's wrong with it? Okay. Yeah. It was interesting because, I, I mean, it took us about three months to sell our house up north. Now, it was dated without question, Like, I, and I've already talked about that. Um, but even now, it's uh, that we were told at the time, two months-ish, you know, then you've got to start looking at stuff. And that was seven, eight years ago. I'm sure it's changed a lot now. So a month is roughly the guideline, um, yeah. which is amazing. And there's only one me. reason a house doesn't sell. And that is? I was going to let you guess. Uh, uh, well, I would say overpriced. Price. Yeah, price. Yeah, okay. If I you price the house, like, right? It's too obvious an answer. Maybe there's something else I'm not thinking yeah. of, but it's, price. Right. it's overpriced. If you right. price it right, it will sell. Yep. So what can a seller do? Uh, I would encourage every seller to get a home inspection, get a pre-inspection. And this is why. Before you put the house on the market, find out if there are any issues. Because, and I work with many home inspectors, many mold mitigators. I mean, I have some great people. I'll say on my team, meaning they're people I would normally give their names out with confidence. Say we uh, have a, an inspection done and the home inspector finds mold. Mm. And you, Mr. Seller, call in somebody and they say, well, it's going to be $2,300 to mitigate this. Now, the buyer brings in somebody and they say, oh, it's going to be $8,700 to mitigate it. Well, if I'm the buyer, I'm going to say, well, I want 8,700 taken off. Right. I don't want What's he doing for 23? He's shortcutting, not doing it right. Well, you just cost yourself a lot of money, Mr. Seller, because if you had had it looked out ahead of time and you knew, okay, we have mold, you have two options. You could either have it mitigated and then disclose, hey, we had a pre-inspection, they found mold, Here's the paperwork to show you that we had it mitigated correctly by a licensed professional. Or you could provide the report that shows, hey, we know we have mold. Mm -hmm. Here it is. This is where it is. We're not taking care of it. Factor that into whatever you offer us. So pre-inspection is, I think, critical. Because otherwise, you could run into that situation where you're held hostage. And don't forget, well, the way that we work here in Upstate is we have a contract. We go through attorney approval. The attorney approves the contract. The property is marked as under contract or pending, meaning somebody has written a, say, um, a contract on it. Mm -hmm. Then they have the home inspection. So if during the home inspection, the seller or the buyer decides to back out because there's a, a major defect, 
Now you have to put the house back on the market and you've lost your momentum. Gotcha. Because now you're not active, you're back on the market. And that's got to raise a red flag too, right? If, sure. Yeah, I would think it would. Um, and and I, I mean, I've seen that happen in various places where you see a house is on the market, then it goes off, and then a month later it's back on. And you're like, why is that going on? Now I know, you know, it's... Um. And I'm that, smirking because it's like being on Tinder. You're like, that guy's back on here. He was just on here a month ago. I wonder what's going on. <laughs> well, just for the record, I've never been on Tinder. <laughs> so I it's don't a know. circus. Is it, it really? It. it is a circus. Oh, my I, God. I know nothing about it, to be honest. And I don't care to know any more than what you've told me. It's been a, um, it's been a long time. <laughs> on that note, you know what? We're going to take a quick break um, and then come back, chat a little bit more. So join us in a few minutes on the Living Fit After 50 podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Living Fit After 50. I forgot to mention, hey, don't forget to check out our website. Uh, There's prior shows on that. Lots of other information, fitness and over 50 related. It's livingfitafter50.com. So, hey, head on over and check that out. Shameless plug. I freely admit it. Okay. All right. We're back with Suzanne. She's, she's laughing. But, hey, we are a business too, right? We got to promote ourselves. So, what I wanted to kind of go in the final segment here is how do you foresee the market in the future? What do you see changing? What do you see saying the same? Kind of just go with it. Whatever you want to share with the audience. You know, there was a time when I could read the market. Like I would tell people, I'd never buy a house between March and August. Enjoy your summer work on your tan. Because historically, all the buyers are out in the spring and the summer. And if they have not bought their home by the first week in August, they're not going to buy because they want their little darlings situated in their new school district. Because we've had such a low inventory, we no longer have those cycles. Interesting. Uh, Because, again, it used to be you put a house on in November and December. You know, typically my first question I ask when I sit at a listing presentation is, what changed? Okay. For somebody to move. Mm -hmm. If it's in November, December, January is number one transfer month. Really? Sad, but Wait a true. minute. Just stop you one sec. January is the number one. Yes, because think about it. Companies are doing their end of the year budgets and somebody's getting transferred to Albany, New York. I never would have guessed January. I would have said like springtime. January 5th is the lowest day historically for inventory. Wow. Best I, day to put your house on the market. And wow. people break up over the holidays. Yeah, I've heard that one before. Yep. Think about it. that's the last Thanksgiving. Your mother's going to talk to me that way, and you're going to ask for more potatoes instead of stuff. <laughs> <stuff. laughs> yeah, and we're going to get the kids through the holidays, and then we're, you know, so so a lot happens in the winter. But you know, because before I used to be able to predict the market. Now, you know, I don't know what's going to happen because. I think, and this is just Suzanne Prezio talking as a as a lay person, not as a realtor. I think we're going to see people start losing their jobs. Um, the remote work, I think, is going to, some of the employers are going to start pulling in the reins and they're going to want people back in the office. Yeah, we're seeing more and more of that everywhere. So people that have bought homes that aren't anywhere near home base... They're going to have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. What we also saw, now it used to be, you know, you'd buy your first home and you'd save your money and then you'd replace your windows and then you'd save your money and maybe you'd replace some carpets and then, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I'm finding that the younger generation, (laughs) they're doing everything on payment. They do not have any money in the bank and everything to them is a payment. Mm Mm-hmm. That mortgage is a payment and it is paycheck to paycheck. So because prices were so out of the park, 
you know, before you'd run into trouble, you'd go to your parents, you'd say, hey, you know, we're a little lean, we need a refrigerator. Could you front me some money? I'll pay you back. And your parents helped you out and you paid them back. Mm -hmm. Now, for the children to be able to get a home, the parents have tapped into their 401ks to give them the down payment. So if they run into a financial hardship down the road, their parents have already bailed them out. They're tapped out. So I, I think... And again, this is just my opinion, but I think we're going to start seeing some of that where people are just going to have to walk away from their homes. Problem with that is the municipalities have already budgeted for those those tax revenues. And could that cause taxes to go up in certain areas? Because I don't see the municipalities lowering their their budgets because homes are being foreclosed on it's a good point so, yeah well it's funny because yeah. you know you, you look at cars is another one right car prices skyrocketed in the last couple of years used cars is spe- specifically and you know you think back two three years ago and forget the political side of it but people were getting six hundred dollars a week in extra income so they were going out buying i had a person tell me they were buying like escalates well seven hundred dollar a month car payment and now that six hundred dollars is gone those cars are getting repossessed like crazy and it kind of is going into what you're talking about we could see a wave of house housing repossessions um, and and is it a fair statement to say the banks have tightened down on giving out mortgages at this point? It's yes. that's the impression I've gotten. Is there there the person that might have been on the edge, real close? Now they're saying no instead of yes. Yeah. It seems to be my perception of it. So you're nodding your head. So I'm assuming that's the case. And then you add in, you know, interest rates are up. Um, you know, you got a three hundred thousand dollar house. People don't realize a six percent mortgage on a three hundred dollars. $300,000 house is $18,000 a year in interest. That's what, $1,500 a month, just interest. Then you got and, principal and escrow, insurance, all that stuff. Um, and again, that's where an agent can help because you'll make them aware of that. Whereas a lot of them, I think, are going in going, I got $1,500 a month. I can afford this $300,000. No, you can't. Exactly. And that's what I'll tell them. I'll say that, you know, your lender may have approved you for here. Yep. You still want things like food, heat. Yeah. <laughs> if you get invited to a wedding, you might want to buy a dress, maybe give a gift to go to the movies. You know, this is all factored in before eggs were five ninety nine a dozen. I mean, you know, I, I feel badly for elderly people because, you know, their pets are everything to them. I, I just went to the pet store and bought oh, it's cat food. I could not believe how much, no it's, offense, Lou, how much <laughs> it cost me to feed my two cats for the month. It's insane. We, we, my wife and I had this conversation a couple of weeks ago. The dog food, it seems like, is as much as ours now. Yeah. And of course, the dogs come first. You know. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. It was it was forty seven dollars for a ten pound bag of their food. Do you find that that's generational though, where our generation tends to realize that you know you got to have that buffer. Um, or do you, and the younger ones tend to spend, 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 but I've had people say it's it, even our generation, they, they're living paycheck to paycheck. What are you seeing in relation to like housing with that? I think it's generational. I do. I mean, there's always going to be people, our generation that you, you get nervous, just listening to them talking that, wow, how do you sleep at night, man? Yeah. But the generation that's coming up, uh, it's, it's. It's an instantaneous, I want things now. And and I don't mean that, you know, great. I mean, I appreciate the fact that, you know, but I think a lot of it, I'm going to sound like an old lady, has to do with, you know, you want to know something. It used to be, say we went out to dinner and we were talking about a movie and, oh, what's that? Who's that actor? Who is that actor? And you'd go home and you'd look it up. Mm-hmm. And then you'd call me at 1130 at night. Yeah. And be like, you know, it was Tom Hanks. Oh, yeah, that's who it was. All right. Good night. Now you just look it up at the table. 
Right. You pull out the phone and, and Google it. Yeah. So there is no, I mean, what's the last time you talked to somebody under 30 who had a budget? Well, that that's kind of where I was going with it all is they don't realize how they're spending their money, right? I think our generation, and there are exceptions on both ends, to be fair, right? But I think when you're trying to buy a house and again, it's that HGTV effect. I want a five bed, you know, there's two people. I want a five bedroom house because, um, you know, I might have a guest over. Well, you need one bedroom for that, not three extra. Um, or that I'd love, by the way, what the hell's with this open concept thing? It's like they're obsessed with it. <laughs> Sorry, I, I want to be. Yeah, I want to be able to go hide in the kitchen and eat like, cookies and nobody's looking. <laughs> every every show you see on TV, that's all they talk about. Open concept, and I'm like, yeah. oh, I can't look. This house is perfect. It's not open concept. I don't want it. It's like, anyway, sorry. I I just had to go there because I crack up about it every time. But I do see that you know, it used to be. I think roughly the guideline was thirty percent of your income should go towards your housing. I don't know if that still applies. Um, no, but I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I be, think it's I changed. I because I'm starting to see people that are, the banks may want that, but they're they're getting like realistically, some of them are fifty percent of their income is going towards their housing because they oh. way overbought on their house. Yeah. And then my fear is like you were just talking about that we're going to see they can't you know they lose their job, their job you know they can't do the remote anymore. They have to go in an office while well, their office is forty miles away or hundred miles away, whatever. That's a big change. I mean, you look at the West Coast, yeah. all the people in San Francisco that bought these million dollar homes because they worked for Google, Facebook, now they're out of a job. They're going to be homeless in yes. days, probably. Yes. Um, you know, I talking about the future of the market, I, I kind of agree with you. I it's it's an unknown, but it's a scary unknown to me. And uh you know, my advice to people, and feel free to chime in, is be conservative with it, right? Yeah, you want that five-bedroom house, but you know what? You can get by with a three. Um, I had a family of eight back in the day. We had one bathroom. We made it work. It was not easy. We didn't need a bathroom, an ensuite. That's the other one that cracks me up. Everything's got to have an ensuite. It's a bathroom, okay? <laughs> you can laugh at me. Feel free. <laughs> it's a bathroom, Okay. Or I got to have the walk-in closet that my entire house would fit in. You don't need those things. Those are nice to have. Be more conservative, and especially as you're getting older. Because let me tell you, folks, at almost 60 myself, the best move I ever did was to downsize. I don't have to worry about cleaning, spending hours cleaning. Maintenance, right? The bigger the home, the more the maintenance. My utility bills are high for, you know, I think. But relatively speaking, they're not. <laughs> You know, it's find put find a home that can be your home, but not put you in financial trouble potentially. Because as you're getting older, the day's going to come. Most likely, you're going to end up on some sort of a fixed income, whether it's retirement, Social Security, a combination thereof. Um, and you don't realize that housing's still going to go up. It's not going to be any cheaper ten years from now. I don't think um, interest rates. Who knows? Get yourself a nice home that you can be happy in. Have a few extras, but don't go crazy. I think more so the younger generations, but even in our generation, it's. I see these people, there's a couple, and they're living in a 5,000 square foot house. And then, like you said, they're living paycheck to paycheck now, and then they're going to retire in 5, 10, 15 years. It'll be a whole other ballgame then. So let's close out with what else? Did we not talk about, or what? Is there anything that you'd like to add to what we've talked about that you think people should know? You know, uh, again, just when when thinking about purchasing, just be mindful of the long term. Uh, you know, don't have stars in your eyes, and this is a really pretty house. You know, look, look at the things that are already in place as far as you know. Is there a fence? That's great for safety. Your walkability. If for some reason you can't drive, will you be able to walk places? Or is it not going to be that expensive to have groceries delivered or have to take an Uber to a doctor? Um, those lo you know, location is very important when you are relocating. Um, and 
you know, don't be afraid to interview more than one realtor. Uh, and and honestly, I think I think a, a sound piece of advice is you get what you pay for. I mean, I have people that will say, well, you know, 6%. Well, if I'm immediately going to hit the mat and say, well, well, you know, I'll do it for five. What am I going to do when I'm negotiating for your house? <laughs> right. Oh, well, I'll take this. You know, yeah. you get what you pay for. Right. Anyone that's going to work for less isn't going to do more. They're not. So, but I appreciate you having Lucy and I on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we need to see more of Lucy into. before we go. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for joining us. I'm going to throw us to a quick break and then come back and wrap things up. We'll be right back on the Living Fat After 50 show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Living Fat After 50. We're getting ready to wind down the show. It's been an awesome absolutely awesome i know i've learned new stuff and hopefully you have um hey if you've watched this far you know you liked it obviously because you wouldn't have watched it this far if you didn't so do me a favor will you hit that like button because it helps us to promote the show and get the word out um if you're watching us on youtube subscribe because we do weekly shows uh we also have tips that we send out daily so you'll get if you subscribe and you hit the notification button, you'll get notified when we post something. And don't forget, we have our website, Living Fit After 50. You can go there and see prior shows. There's fitness tips on there. Um, our blog is on there where I share various things about fitness and life in general, health, wellness, all that stuff. Lots of fun stuff on that. So head on over to Living Fit After 50. And I do want to finish this out by saying to Suzanne, a very sincere thank you for joining us. Um, I truly appreciate you taking the time. I know you're busy. Tell us how people can reach you. If they have questions or want to reach out to you or engage your services, how can they do that? Well, thank you for having me on. This was this was wonderful. Uh, you can call me at 518-577-6571. My website is SuzannePrezio.com. You can find me on Instagram at Suze Prezio, S-U-Z, Suze Prezio underscore real life real estate. You can find me on Facebook, Suzanne Yakabuchi Prezio. <laughs> uh, probably the easiest way is just send me a text or give me a call, 518-577-6571. And my email is Suzanne at SuzannePrezio.com. Thanks awesome. again, Dan. Thank you. And I will put links below to as much of that as I can possibly remember. Actually, Suzanne, email it to me. And that way you'll be the one that reminds me because <laughs> okay. I do want people to be able to reach out to you because I think you are the bomb. I'm going to say it. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, it's, you know, one of the things we want to do with this show is to help people over 50 to have better lives. It's not just, you know, exercise and diet that we talk about. We want to share information such as, hey, maybe I want to relocate or I want to buy a new home. And I truly appreciate you coming on and sharing that information and helping people out. So thank you again. You're very welcome. You made me look good. Thanks, Dan. Oh, you made yourself <laughs> look good. All right. On that note, thank you again for watching. Like I said earlier, hit that like, hit that subscribe and come on back next week i've got another awesome guest coming on i'm not going to tell you anything about it but trust me you don't want to miss it all right till next time this is dan have an awesome day